Hello everyone, thank you all for being here. This means that you're interested in corrosion. Indeed, corrosion is a very important topic and it's an interesting issue in construction. Why? There are many reasons for that and one of them is related to its economic relevance. So, according to the NACE report published in 2016, the universal annual direct cost of corrosion is estimated at 2.5 trillion US dollars, which is equivalent to 3.4% of the universal GDP. Now, the indirect cost should be of the same order of magnitude. In reinforced concrete, corrosion is the main cause of the premature degradation of the structures and it causes very high costs that are comparable to those related to weather and climate disasters. However, the difficulties that are found in this domain are mostly related to phenomenological understanding and problems related to metrology and electrochemical maintenance. This work is part of the ANR Mot de Vie research program, which represents the modeling part of the French national project Pertub. So Mot de Vie gathers 10 partners, which are experts in the fields of mass transfer and corrosion, all involved in the study of the initiation and propagation of corrosion induced by chlorides and carbonation, and also the estimation of the duration of service life of concrete structures under the risk of corrosion. Now, the present work only concerns the chloride-induced corrosion in concrete. So how does this phenomenon happen? Once the steel is in contact with the concrete, which represents an alkaline environment, a thin layer of corrosion products is formed at the steel-concrete interface, which restrains further oxidation. This phenomenon is called passivation of steel, which means that the steel is in a passive state. However, in presence of chlorides, it is assumed that corrosion initiation occurs when the chloride content at the depths of the rebar reaches a critical chloride threshold value called secret. Hence, the steel is locally depassivated and a microcell corrosion is established since the remaining steel area of the rebar besides the active spot or in the other layers of reinforcement is still in a passive state. Chloride-induced corrosion of steel and concrete is an electrochemical phenomenon involving two main reactions. The oxidation of iron at the anode, generating electrons needed for the reduction of dissolved oxygen when available at the cathode. As a result, an electronic current circulates through the metal since electrons are transported from the anodic sites towards the cathodic sites and an ionic current flows through the concrete electrolyte, which is the interstitial solution of concrete. Nowadays, the major concern for industrial companies is the duration of service life of reinforced concrete structures. According to Tutti's model, the service life can be divided into an initiation stage and a propagation stage. The initiation phase is the time needed for chlorides to reach a critical chloride threshold value required for the depassivation of steel. For this purpose, several standards such as the EN206 limit the maximum amount of chlorides initially present in the mix according to the type of the structure, where only 0.4% per weight of binder is allowed for reinforced concrete. While for concrete made with a cement type SAM3, it depends on the country. For example, in France, 0.65% is allowed. Now, the transition from initiation to propagation phase is not an instant event, but rather a period of time during which the depassivation process takes place. So, the propagation stage is the period after the depassivation where active corrosion takes place. Lots of methods for lifetime prediction only discuss the initiation stage without including the corrosion propagation. However, this was found to be, in many times, in contradiction with experience feedbacks. Therefore, it's very important to incorporate a part of the propagation period in the lifetime of the structure. All these observations led to the following objectives. Firstly, it was important to develop a new experimental protocol allowing to measure the microcell corrosion current between anode and cathode. Secondly, 
It was necessary to use this protocol in order to determine the critical chloride content initiating corrosion and to study the impact of several parameters on secret. And finally, given the importance of including the corrosion propagation in the service life of the structure, it was important to evaluate the effect of several factors on the corrosion propagation phase. Before proceeding to the work that was achieved in the status, let's take a quick look at the critical chloride contents in literature. Many research reviews have gathered together secret values published in European and North American data, and a large number of Chinese publications have also been evaluated recently. From all these reported data, it was found that secret values were considerably scattered. So the question really is, why do we have all this scatter? The key answer lies in the investigation of the steel concrete interface. According to the recently published paper by the RELAM Technical Committee 262, the influencing parameters were classified as factors related to the type of reinforcement bars, the steel surface condition, the concrete microstructure and chemistry, the macroscopic interfacial concrete voids, and finally the temperature and moisture content. The committee was able to highlight the parameters with important or weak effects, the ones with consistent or contradictory effect, and also the factors with weak or no databases. It appears that the steel surface condition is one of the most dominant parameters of the steel concrete interface. It was also found that the influence of factors related to concrete, such as water over binder ratio and cement type, is moderate. However, the reported results were contradictory. This work focused on inspecting the effect of the steel surface condition and the binder type on chloride-induced corrosion in concrete. Given the controversy in the scientific community about the test methods developed to detect corrosion initiation, it was decided to propose a new experimental protocol to determine the critical chloride content initiating corrosion. The experimental setup must take into consideration the localized aspect of corrosion in concrete. Hence, it was based on the galvanic coupling between two physically separated samples the anode specimen, which is contaminated with chlorides, and the cathode specimen, which is chloride-free. It was important to use a preconditioning method that allows to accelerate the chloride ingress in the anode samples, decreasing the time needed to initiate corrosion, which is usually very long. This method was inspired from a previously reported approach in 2005. The electrochemical measurements achieved consisted of measuring the macrocell current between anode and cathode samples with different sizes of cathodes, which allowed us to measure the current for different cathode to anode surface ratios. Now, since most of the critical chloride content are expressed in terms of total chloride levels, it was important to measure the amount of total chlorides in the anode specimens after the end of the electrochemical measurements. However, knowing that it's mainly the free chlorides that are contributing to the depassivation of steel, it was then important to determine both total and free chlorides. Knowing that total chlorides are equal to the sum of free and bound chlorides, it was important to determine the chloride binding isotherms for each formulation, which allowed us later on to achieve the transition from total to free chlorides. Finally, the results obtained were analyzed in terms of microcell currents versus the free chloride contents. Now, the criterion used to detect corrosion initiation and subsequently the critical chloride content secret was based on the concept of anodic control of corrosion and consists of a current that is independent of the cathode to anode surface ratio. You can find the details related to this experimental protocol in an article that we published in 2019 in Cement and Concrete Research. The anode and cathode specimens are reinforced cylindrical samples, where the anode is much smaller than the cathode. 
Both specimens embed at their centers cold rolled ribbed steel bars with a diameter of 6 mm. Given the sizes of anode and cathode, we have here an apparent cathode to anode surface ratio which is equal to 16. Now different mortar and concrete formulations were tested in this protocol. The first two mortar formulations are made with the same type of cement SAM1, however the second one included 10% of silica fume. The concrete formulation C1 was made with a cement type SAM1 and included 15% of limestone addition while the last two concrete formulations, annotated C3, were made with a cement type SAM3, which contained 64% of slag. One of them presented a lower water over binder ratio, and the other one included 15% of limestone addition. Now, different steel surface conditions were also tested in this protocol. However, in this presentation, we are only presenting the results related to the as-received steel, which represents the steel without any specific treatment. The application of the protocol will only be detailed for the mortar formulation M1055, corresponding to a water over binder ratio of 0.55 and the sand over binder ratio equal to 2.75. After the preparation of the samples, they were wet cured in a curing room at a relative humidity of 95%. Then, the anode samples were oven dried at a controlled temperature of 45 degrees Celsius and relative humidity of 25%. The samples were weighed regularly and the drying was stopped when the weight difference between two successive weighings 24 hours apart did not exceed 0.05%. After the anode drying, the samples were soaked in sodium chloride solutions for a duration of 48 hours. Five different concentrations of sodium chloride solutions were tested, from 12 grams per liter up to 280 grams per liter. After the preconditioning of anode samples, cathodes were taken from the curing room and placed with the anodes in a sodium hydroxide solution. The anode and cathode samples were connected by a potentiostat controlled by the OCLAB software using the zero resistance ammeter electrochemical technique to measure the macrocell current between both specimens. The measurement of the current was maintained for a duration of 168 hours in a room where the temperature was controlled at 20 degrees Celsius. At the end of the test, the average galvanic current was then calculated from the integral of the current signal over the test duration. The anode was then connected to a larger cathode, consisting of a reinforced concrete wall containing 18 ribbed steel bars with a diameter of 12 mm. As you can see, the network of frames in the wall was completely electrically disconnected, but it could be electrically connected from the outside using a connection box. The anode was placed in a PVC pipe containing a sodium hydroxide solution, and it could be electrically connected to the different rebars of the wall. When the anode is connected to all the 18 ribbed steel bars of the wall, we can reach very high cathode to anode apparent ratios, up to 3000. After the end of the electrochemical testing, the anode samples were split in half and mortar or concrete was taken from the sampling area shown in red in this figure. It was then transformed into a very fine powder that will be used later on to prepare the solutions needed to measure the total and free chloride contents. The measurement of chlorides was achieved with the potentiometric methods by means of a chloride titrator. And the output of this measurement was the amount of chloride content as percentages per weight of binder. After the presentation of the experimental protocol, it's now time to proceed to the different results obtained from the application of this protocol. This figure presents the macrocell corrosion currents measured during the cathode anode coupling experiment with respect to free chloride contents in case of the apparent cathode to anode surface ratio of 16. It can be observed that for chloride concentrations lower than 0.5% per weight of cement, the macrocell current remains quite constant and negligible. 
However, for higher chloride concentrations, the macrocell current increases quite linearly with the chloride pollution level in the anode specimens and reaches almost 70 microammeter for chloride contents of about 3% per weight of cement. Now we will add to those results the ones that were obtained with a higher cathode to anode ratio of almost 3000. It's possible to see that for chloride levels lower than 0.5%, the current was also low and negligible. This means that the current is independent of the cathode to anode surface ratio. However, for higher chloride concentrations, the current increases with the amount of free chlorides and also becomes higher when the cathode to anode ratio is higher meaning that the current becomes dependent on the cathode to anode surface ratio. This clear transition observed in the experimental relationship highlights the existence of a chloride threshold effect that could be associated with a value of 0.5% per weight of binder. This protocol was applied to the rest of the formulations and the critical chloride contents were determined for each formulation using the same criterion. This table summarizes the different critical chloride contents obtained and expressed in terms of total and free chlorides per weight of binder. It's possible to see that the critical chloride contents increased when the cement was substituted with 10% of silica fume and when the water over binder ratio was decreased to a value lower than 0.5. As for the concrete specimens, it's possible to see that the concrete formulations made with the cement type SEM3, which contains 64% of slag, presented higher critical chloride content values when compared to concrete made with the cement type SEM1. Also, the decrease of the water over binder ratio below 0.5 induces the increase of secret values. Since we have different mortar and concrete formulations with different compositions, it was more convenient to express the chloride threshold initiating corrosion in terms of free chloride concentrations in the porosity, and to investigate the evolution of this parameter according to the porosity of the cement paste. This figure presents the results of the free chloride concentrations initiating corrosion that were obtained according to the porosity of the cement paste that were classified according to the type of cement, SEM1 or SEM3. It's possible to see that the increase in the porosity of cement paste is associated with the decrease of the free chloride concentration initiating corrosion whatever the type of cement, with the concentrations being slightly higher in case of the cement type SEM3. To add more values to those results, free chloride concentrations were taken from literature from experiments achieved on steel directly immersed in alkaline solutions. Despite the scatter, these chloride concentrations were mainly lower than the ones reported in the study. Additionally, it's convenient to assume that, for a porosity of 0%, the threshold concentration initiating corrosion is supposed infinite, since no corrosion occurs. All these results and observations put together show that there could be a relationship between the free chloride concentration initiating corrosion and the porosity of the cement paste. This statement needs to be confirmed by further investigations, however. To conclude on this protocol, one of the advantages of the proposed approach is that it relies on the measurement of the macrocell current between a predefined anodic element and the cathode. Thanks to this, the approach is less susceptible to experimental artifacts than other techniques previously reported. Secondly, the protocol was found to be applicable to the different mortar and concrete mixes with the different types of binder. Finally, and most importantly, the chloride ingress was effectively accelerated by the preconditioning approach that was adopted. As for the main findings that were deduced from this protocol, Firstly, the use of supplementary cementious materials like SEM3A and silica fume resulted in the increase of the critical chloride content initiating corrosion. 
Secondly, the decrease of the water over binder ratio below 0.5 resulted in the increase of the critical chloride content, which is in agreement with most of the previously reported data. Thirdly, the higher initial chloride level allowed by the EN206 standard in France for SEM3 concrete, which is 0.65%, seems to be acceptable given the higher secret values that were obtained. And finally, a potential relationship could exist between the critical free chloride concentration initiating corrosion and the porosity of the cement paste with slightly higher concentrations in the case of mixtures with SAM3A. After presenting the part related to the corrosion initiation phase, it's time to move on to the part concerning corrosion propagation. As stated before, the corrosion propagation phase is an important phase that must be added to the surface life of the structure. Lots of parameters are known to affect the rate of the corrosion propagation, like the oxygen availability, the cementious binders, temperature, the geometry of the structure, the level of chlorides, electrical resistivity, and moisture content. Lots of these parameters were investigated in the studies. Let's take, for example, the parameter related to chlorides. If we consider the results obtained from the anode cathode coupling experiment, we found that the increase in the chloride level led to the increase in the macrocell current. In order to better understand this result, it was important to investigate closely the experimental outcomes and to study in detail the effect of the chloride level on the electrochemical behavior of active steel. The polarization behavior of a uniform corrosion system can be modeled by the butler volmer equation, which represents the relationship between the potential of the system under polarization and the associated net current density produced at the steel concrete interface. This equation includes several electrochemical parameters, such as the corrosion current density, the potential at equilibrium, the anodic tafel slope corresponding to the oxidation reaction of iron, and the cathodic tafel slope corresponding to the reduction reaction of oxygen when oxygen is available. Lots of numerical models developed for the study of the propagation period of reinforcement corrosion involve these parameters as input data. It's then very important to accurately characterize the parameters for active and passive steel in order to properly simulate the corrosion propagation. Regarding corrosion of steel and concrete, the two involved reversible electrodes are formed by the redox couples of iron and oxygen. This figure illustrates the polarization curves of these reversible electrodes and also the curve of the resulting uniform corrosion system. From both reversible electrodes, the corrosion potential and corrosion current density can be exactly determined. As you can see, both parameters are dependent on the anodic tafel coefficient Vta A. This figure shows the result of two simple simulations performed here by using two values of the anodic tafel coefficient of iron. Now, the labels Vta A A and Vta A P were used to represent parameters related to active and passive steel respectively. The curve in blue was made with the parameter Vta A P while the curve in red was made with the parameter Vita AA, with Vita AA being much lower than Vita AP. So, according to this observation, it could be relevant to build a fundamental description of active and passive steel, which is only based on the modification of the anodic tafel coefficient of steel, while all the other reversible electrode properties are maintained constant. Therefore, an approach was developed and consisted of the exploitation and interpretation of the results obtained from the anode cathode coupling test that was previously presented in case of the mortar formulation M1055. The first step of this approach was to characterize the electrochemical parameters of steel. In addition to the cathode anode coupling experiment, Polarization tests were conducted separately on anode and cathode samples to get the polarization curves. 
The steel at the cathode samples is in a uniform passive state. Therefore, the electrochemical parameters of passive steel could be directly measured. On the other hand, the autopsies of the anode samples showed that the steel was not entirely in an active state. Hence, parameters of active steel could not be directly deduced from the polarization test. Therefore, it was important to quantify the parameters of pure active steel using a numerical optimization approach based on the fundamental effect of the iron anodic tuffle coefficient that was described earlier, with particular attention on the effect of the chloride content. In order to validate the results of the optimization, the electrochemical properties of active and passive steel were then used as input parameters of numerical simulations aimed at reproducing the experimental anode-cathode galvanic coupling. All the numerical simulations that were adopted in this approach were performed by using the COMSOL multiphysics software based on the finite element methods. You can find more details concerning this approach and also the results that were found in an article that we published in 2020 in Materials and Corrosion. In order to know the actual active steel surface, microscopic inspections of the steel of the anode samples were carried out. As expected, these observations confirmed that the steel bars were not completely in an active state, but represented a mix of passive and active sites. The autopsies revealed that the corroding active area increases with the increase in the free chloride content. The active steel chloride relation can be modeled with an empirical linear model. This model will be used later on as an input parameter in numerical simulations. Concerning the electrical resistivity, two different approaches were implemented. The first one consisted of a direct measurement using resistivity meter. The second one consisted of using a numerical model to assess the specimen geometrical factor. As expected, the increase in the free chloride content led to the decrease of the electrical resistivity. An empirical relationship was developed between the electrical resistivity and the free chloride content and it will be used later on as an input parameter in the future numerical simulations. The numerical optimization procedure consisted of fitting the simulated polarization response to the experimental polarization curves of 10 different anode specimens contaminated with different chloride levels. Therefore, we needed to have the anode polarization curves of these specimens and also their chloride levels. To simulate the passive area in the anodes, it was also important to have the electrochemical characteristics of the passive steel, which were directly extracted from polarization tests realized on the cathode samples. It was also needed to have the surface area of active steel and the electrical resistivity relative to the level of chloride contamination of each anode, which were deduced from the empirical relationships defined earlier. Another assumption of this optimization is that the cathodic tafel coefficient corresponding to the reduction reaction of oxygen was considered the same whether the steel was in a passive or in an active state. And finally, the last two equations of this optimization procedure consisted of the relationship between the corrosion current density and the anodic tafel coefficient and the corrosion potential and the anodic tafel coefficient that were previously presented. The Nelder-Mead algorithm was used in this optimization procedure, in which only the iron anodic tafel coefficient was computed for each anode sample, and subsequently for each chloride content. And finally, the output of this optimization was the anodic tafel coefficient corresponding to each chloride level, from which we can deduce the corrosion current density and the corrosion potential. This figure illustrates the results of the numerical optimization of the anodic tafel coefficient in relation with the level of chloride contamination. An eleventh point was added corresponding to the iron anodic coefficient at passive state which was concluded from the polarization curves of the cathode samples. The chloride threshold effect that was discussed earlier regarding the galvanic coupling test is also visible in this experiment. 
However, even if a steer variation is observed around the chloride level of 0.5%, representing the critical chloride content initiating corrosion, the transition of the anodic tafil coefficient from the passive state to the active state with the increase in the chloride content appears as a quite continuous phenomenon. Moreover, for chloride contents greater than 1%, the anodic tafel slope seems to decrease quite linearly with the chloride content. This empirical relationship between the chloride content and the iron anodic tafel coefficient was modeled as an empirical pseudosigmoidal behavior. The values of the corrosion current density and the corrosion potential can be deduced from the anodic tafel coefficient and are therefore also dependent on the chloride level. Three-dimensional numerical simulations were performed to reproduce the galvanic coupling test between the anode and cathode using as input parameters the properties of passive and active steel that were deduced from the study. This figure presents the experimental results and the numerical results obtained from three different scenarios tested according to three different morphology of the active spot. All these morphologies of the active spot represent the same steel surface area, however they are distributed differently, where the one in red, for example, it is a monospot that is centered on the rebar, while the other two are mainly distributed along the rebar. We can see that we have a good qualitative correlation between the experimental points and the two scenarios where the active spot consisted of more than one spot distributed on the rebar. To conclude on this study concerning the effect of chlorides on the electrochemical properties of steel, in case of corrosion initiation, the results of the iron anodic tafel coefficient show the existence of a chloride threshold effect with a continuous transition from passive to active state. In case of corrosion propagation, the numerical modeling of steel corrosion in reinforced concrete requires taking into consideration the effect of the chloride contamination level on three parameters. Firstly, the electrical resistivity of concrete or mortar. Secondly, the surface area of active steel. And finally, and most importantly, the iron anodic tafel coefficient and subsequently the potential and the corrosion current density. Now let's go back to the parameters affecting corrosion propagation. When dealing with corrosion propagation, it's crucial to consider parameters related to the geometry of the structure, like the mobilizable cathode and to electrical resistivity. The mobilizable cathode, also known as the zone of influence, is the extent to which the steel board can act cathodically and contribute to the macrocell corrosion process. In reality, the reinforcement network is a three-dimensional geometry, which is usually a complex system to study. Therefore, it was decided to test the impact of the mobilizable cathode and electrical resistivity using a one-dimensional geometry. A reinforced mortar beam was cast to perform the experimental test. The beam had a length of 10 meters and contained a single bed of reinforcement bars that was composed of 20 ribbed steel bars with a diameter of 12 millimeters, 19 of which were entirely in a passive state and acted as cathodes, and one of them acted as anodes and was contaminated with chlorides. This anode, located at the first end of the beam, was exposed to sodium chloride contamination in order to initiate its corrosion. You can find all the details related to the experimental setup and the corresponding studies and results in an article that we published in Construction and Building Materials in 2020. Two experimental campaigns were achieved in the study. The first one consisted of measuring the corrosion current between the anode and each cathode separately. Each current measured corresponded to the same cathode-to-anode ratio, which is equal to 10, but to a different cathode-to-anode distance. As we can see here, when the anode was connected to a more distant cathode, C10, the measured current was lower than the one measured with the closest cathode, C1. In the second experimental campaign, the anode was connected simultaneously to all the identical cathode bars located at different distances from the anode. 
the current provided by each cathode was measured. A multimeter was connected in series with the system to measure the total current of the system and to make sure that it was equal to the sum of the currents provided by each cathode bar. In parallel to the experimental campaigns, numerical studies of these experiments were also achieved using the software Comsol Multiphysics. Here's an example of the numerical model and boundary conditions used to simulate the coupling between the anode and the closest cathode C1. This figure presents the different experimental and numerical results of the currents provided by each cathode versus the center-to-center cathode-to-anode distance. These results correspond to the case where the anode was connected to each cathode separately. To simplify the presentation, the results were presented in terms of percentages of current versus the corrosion current obtained when connecting the anode with the first cathode bar C1. It's possible to see that there is a good correlation between the experimental points and the numerical results. As expected, both experimental and numerical results show that the measured current decreased with the increase of the separation distance between the anode and the connected cathode. This could be explained by the increase in the cathode-anode distance induced by the increase in electrical resistance, which is also known as the ohmic resistance effect. Yet, it was surprising to see that the current at a distance of almost 9 meters from the anode represented almost 30% of the current. This means that the macrocell current can be provided by cathodes at large distances from the anode. The results show that in cases of partly submerged structures where corrosion is initiated in an emerged region of the structure where oxygen is usually very limited or not available, the mobilized cathodic area could be far away from the anode and aerated parts of the structure where oxygen is available. These results are supported by the severe localized corrosion observed in the submerged region of the reinforced concrete structures. Walsh and Sagwes conducted a field assessment of reinforced concrete pilings from marine bridges. They found severe localized corrosion-related cross-section loss in bridge rebars located at depths higher than 4 meters below waterline. So this could be explained by the fact that the anodic areas were connected to cathodes located at distances higher than 4 meters from the anode. Let's move on to the results obtained from the second experimental campaign where the anode was connected to all the cathodic bars simultaneously. This figure shows the distribution of the corrosion currents provided by each cathodic bar of the reinforced beam. Both experimental and numerical results show that the current provided by each cathodic bar is strongly affected by the cathode anode distance, where the closest bar received the largest part of the current, which is equal to 30%, whereas the most distant bars received a very limited part of the current, 1% and even less. This means that the cathodic activity is mostly involved close to the anode, and then there is a strong decrease with the increase of the ohmic resistance. The numerical results achieved in the study correspond to an electrical resistivity of 80 ohm meters, which is equivalent to the resistivity of the mortar beam. So, what would be the effect of electrical resistivity on the distribution of the macrocell current? Using numerical simulation, it was possible to calculate the corrosion currents provided by the different cathodic bars for different electrical resistivities of the beam. The numerical results show that the electrical resistivity has an impact on the distribution of the macrocell current, in a way that the closest cathode provided more corrosion current when electrical resistivity was higher. It's possible to see that in case of a very low resistivity of 1 ohm meter, the current slowly decreases with the distance and the distribution is more uniform along the beam. To infer the mobilizable distance, it's possible to define the zone of influence of an anodic area, which is annotated Dmax, by fixing a reference criterion of, for example, 80% of the total current for the cumulative cathodic current provided in this zone, which means that only 20% of the total current goes to cathodes located outside the zone of influence. This table on the left presents the lengths of the zone of influence for each electrical resistivity according to the fixed criterion. 
It clearly shows that the zone of influence decreases when the electrical resistivity is higher. The figure on the right displays the evolution of Dmax with the electrical resistivity and the corresponding fitting model. The latter was determined by a power equation optimized with the aim of minimizing the mean square error between the points in red and the fitted model. It would be interesting to do an analogy between the zone of influence in case of macrocell corrosion in concrete, which is usually not very popular, and the zone of influence of sacrificial anode in case of cathodic protection of structures in concrete and soils, which is usually very popular. To conclude on this part, we saw that corrosion can be provided by cathodes distant from the anode. In case of a one-dimensional reinforcement, the distance could be higher than 10 meters for humid concrete. This could mean that the anode in emerged part of the structure could be connected to distant aerated parts of the structure. This study also investigated the zone of influence in case of macrocell corrosion in concrete. The experiments allowed quantifying the current distribution and the numerical simulations showed the role of electrical resistivity on the zone of influence. The results allow to highlight the benefit of using a blended cement, for example, that increases the concrete resistivity and consequently reduces the zone of influence, which could be reduced up to a factor of 3 or even higher. The last part of this presentation concerns the conclusion and perspective. The conclusion were classified according to the different objectives of this presentation. Concerning the experimental protocol developed to determine the critical chloride content initiating corrosion, we found that the test method developed relies on the measurement of the macrocell current between anode and cathode, which makes it easier to interpret when compared to previously reported protocol. Besides corrosion initiation, another aspect of the protocol is that it allows to study the corrosion propagation. As for the study of the impact of several parameters on the critical chloride content, the results show the existence of a chloride threshold effect which could be characterized at a macroscopic level with chloride-dependent electrochemical parameters. We also found that the use of supplementary cementious materials resulted in the increase of the critical chloride content, making them a beneficial parameter for corrosion initiation. And finally, the critical free chloride concentration initiating corrosion could be a function of the porosity and the cement type. Regarding the corrosion propagation phase, it was found that the increase in the chloride level induced the increase in the macrocell current, which could be explained by the impact of chlorides on several parameters, the electrical resistivity of concrete or mortar, the surface area of active steel, and finally and most importantly, the electrochemical properties of active steel. The impact of macrocell geometry and electrical resistivity were also evaluated. It was shown that the macrocell corrosion current can be provided by cathodes distant from the anode. This could mean that if corrosion is initiated in an emerged region of partially submerged structure, it could be coupled with a cathodic area and aerated parts of the structure. As for electrical resistivity, it seems that it has a big impact on the distribution of the macrocell current in a way that the increase in electrical resistivity reduces the zone of influence of cathodes. On the basis of the work undertaken in the present TEDS, the following perspectives are given. Concerning corrosion initiation, an experimental protocol was developed to determine the critical chloride content with promising results. However, before considering this approach for standardization, further testing should be conducted to increase the statistical database, the precision and the productability of the test methods. The transfer of laboratory results to engineering structures should be conducted by introducing partial safety factors for critical chloride threshold values. For example, to take into consideration the size effect, we can adopt the weakest link theory that allows to transfer the values measured on laboratory specimen size to a bigger size. As for corrosion propagation, the different parameters that were investigated were used later on to develop an empirical engineering model for the prediction of the duration of corrosion propagation. The service limit criterion used was the appearance of the first corrosion-induced cracks. 
At this stage, a critical evaluation of the assumptions being made in the development of the model is urgently required. Secondly, the improved model can be used to formulate a semi-probabilistic model allowing to supply reliable and understandable results for civil engineers. And finally, the service life model should be validated against experimental data and field observations. Many engineering disasters are the results of bad maintenance and not bad design. The long-term durability of the structures is then a very important parameter to public safety. The more we understand the chloride-induced corrosion in concrete structures, the more we have opportunities to resolve the challenges related to economic, environmental, educational, societal and technological problems. Thank you for watching and I hope you enjoyed it.